Hello and welcome to everyone uh, to what is actually our seventh Market Out webinar uh, event for this year. Um, and today's discussion, which will be taking a look at the current state of the global refining project market, uh, and we'll be taking a particular focus uh, at, at some of those spending trends being tracked across uh, just a select number of key market regions. And obviously, we'll be looking at uh, reviewing and assessing what is driving the shape of that spending from a supply versus demand profile. Uh, my name is Shaheen Jahan, and I'll be one of your presenters today. Um, also on the call, uh, I'm very uh, pleased and delighted to be joined by our Vice President of Global Refining Research, Chris Paschal. Uh, Chris is based in our Texas head office. Uh, before we get stuck into the numbers, I would just like to say a very big thank you to our webinar sponsor today, um, Hilco Filtration Systems. Hilco are a division of the Hilliard Corporation. Uh, and those folks are a global provider of uh, motion control and filtration uh, products and services to the oil and gas and the refining sectors, to name but a few. Now, <clears throat> looking first at where we are in terms of momentum of spending, and, and, and by that I mean the tr transition of projects which were previously at the planning and engineering stages and have moved into a successful construction start or kickoff. Well, uh, for those who joined us last year uh, when we did this webinar, there was just around uh, 584 or so projects valued at $95 billion that had already kicked off uh, and were still active and, and under construction. Now, today, when we cut the numbers last week, this compares to just over 780 active projects valued at $127 billion, as you can see here on the left. So just based on these numbers, we can see globally uh, refining projects have continued to show improved realization rates, uh, although it must be noted that um, we've seen an elevation in the spending uh, that is under construction in East Asia, uh, and that's notably down to China, which has seen its uh, under construction activity pick up from last year, which was around about 9.5 billion uh, over the last uh, of, over that particular two-year outlook period, to about 35 billion, as we can see here. So this market has has really made a, a fairly big contribution to the bulk of this increase of under construction activity. So, with that, Chris, as the backdrop, um, what does the forward-looking pipeline of projects, which is still at the planning or engineering engineering stages, what does that still look like at the moment? Well, thanks, Shaheen. Thanks for having me on to discuss uh, the refining industry. So, yes, yeah, so like um, the projects that are currently in play that are under construction, we continue to see uh, a ramp up of uh, project activity in the future uh, when you're looking at projects that are planning and in the engineering stage. So, if you look at the total pipeline of projects, whether it's starting uh, the, the rain or this year or uh, projects that are kicking off well into the next decade, there are almost four times the amount of projects that we're tracking right now, a little over 2,600 projects um, that uh, we're tracking worth $486 billion. So obviously, uh, some of these projects have been around for quite some time. They can continue to be delayed to the right a bit. Um, so perhaps when you start looking at the window, um, always look at really the next two years as well, more or less the sweet spot. So when you start getting into that three to five to 10 year period, uh, the crystal ball becomes a little bit more foggy. So out of that $486 billion of activity that we're, that we're currently tracking um, uh, with, um, uh, um, uh, with a construction kickoff well into the future, the next two years, this year and next year, out of $486 billion, there's only $247 billion of activity here. So you know, the, the spending has improved. Um, you know, the pipeline has improved comparable to the, the last time we did this. Um, you know, uh, uh, the economic back backdrop is improving at this moment. So hopefully we'll continue to see this trend as we move forward. Okay. So Chris, I just want to stick with that theme of the, the kind of the, the, the broader economic backdrop. And obviously one of the, the key inputs to the profitability of the industry is obviously input costs. And, and I, I really just want to take a look at some sort of uh, crude demand profile at the moment. Now, we've obviously seen, and I've heard you talk a number of times over the last quarter, uh, around this uh, demand growth projections, and, and, and obviously we see a lot of this being uh, focused 
those Asian high growth economies. But the reality is many of these emerging markets are actually domestically speaking, I guess, relatively small consumers, even though they are showing quite high uh, rates of crude demand growth. Do you feel that uh, the growth projections that we keep uh, seeing coming out of folks like the IEA and, and, and OPEC, do you think that uh, those projections will continue? And do you think that these are sustainable? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question, Shaheen. Um, you know, I think longer term, they're cer certainly sustainable and realistic goals, um, provided that, um, you know, we don't have a, um, a, cat a cat catastrophic drop in the, um, the global economy. So taking a quick look at the, uh, you know, that, that long-term global crude oil demand forecast, uh, those future developments in energy and oil, oil markets will be driven by really a number of variables, such as population growth, uh, policy changes, shifting demographics, advancements in technologies, and of course, the oil prices. So taking uh, uh, a deeper dive into a little bit of those um, certain of those variables, the global population is projected to increase from uh, two point or excuse me, 7.3 billion in 2015 to 9.2 billion in 2040. The additional 1.8 billion people will mainly come from developing countries. Long-term economic growth will be driven by uh, developing countries as a result of higher labor productivity and a more optimistic demographic outlook. The size of the global economy in 2040 is estimated to be 200% that of 2016, led by substantial increases really in China and in India. Long-term energy policy, policies such as uh, clean energy, electric vehicles, the tightening of the fuel emission standards, and really a reduction of sulfur content and transfer transportation fuels will also have an impact. As a result of these ever-changing factors, the outlook for long-term demand is expected to grow from the 95 million barrels a day um, uh, in 2015 to over 111 by 2040, with that largest contribution of growth really coming back to the China and Indian markets. Now, if we can look at refined products, the demands, you know, what the demand picture looks like, um, uh, when you look at the gas oil and diesel demand, we'll see the, uh, they'll see the largest increase by volume, increasing by 5.7 million, million barrels per day through 2040. This is a result of a rise in demand from road transportation sector in the, in the developing countries, but also due to an ex, uh, expanding fleet of trucks. Additional demand will come from a shift in bunker fuel to, to diesel as a result of the pending IMO 2020 regulation mandate that's uh, upcoming here shortly. Uh, gasoline is the second most important product category. In 2015, more than 24 million barrels a day of gasoline was consumed, with the OECD America accounting for approximately 40%. Looking ahead, gasoline demand is forecast to reach 28 million barrels in 2040. However, growth decelerates sharply over the forecast period Really, uh, during the last 10 years of uh, 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 the last 10 years, um, it only increases marginally. This is a result of shifting trends in road, the, the road transportation sector, such as an increase in penetration of electric vehicles, and really an improving fuel economy, the, the, the fleet of the, of the vehicles. Jet kerosene will also see growth driven by strong demand from the aviation sector, if you noticed, um, most of us fly. Um, a lot of the, uh, they're adding a lot more flight patterns as well as the bookings. But the bunker fuel is the only sector that's forecasted to decrease in demand over the period, mainly as a result, as a result of, the, of that IMO 2020 regulations. And one last sector, which I did not include in the graph, uh, ethane LPG demand represents 11% of the total demand, and it's increasing by almost 3 million barrels a day by 2040 from the current 10.7 in, in 2016. Most of the demand growth will be focused on ethane for, for petrochem use. Um, I believe we have another webinar in June that will discuss um, um, more of the highlights of the, of the chemical industry. And then significant LPG growth is projected for India as a fuel in the residential sector. Chris, um, I'd like to just turn to refining profitability. So we've seen supply, we've seen the demand outlook. Um, and I took a look this morning at, uh, at some of the news wires and, uh, you know, most of the press was stating, you know, crude futures now are, uh, are certainly tipping $78 a barrel for Brent. And uh, I think uh, the West Texas was 72 
uh, dollars for, 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 the, for the futures there. Now, obviously, higher input costs, higher, higher crude prices, this must surely be, uh, I guess, punishing some of those refining margins at present, or would you say that um, margins are holding fairly steady? Yeah, I mean, there certainly is some, um, we're certainly seeing some results um, of higher prices and uh, some of the changing of, um, you know, with uh, some of the, I guess, some of the rumors of the Iran and everything else. We're certainly seeing that influence over the last couple of weeks on margins. But if you take a, a high level glance at the refining margins using, you know, the WTI, which is really a U.S. benchmark, uh, the Brent, which is really the global global benchmark, and the Dubai, you know, the WTI margins, which is the uh, the yellow line here, uh, continue to outpace, you know, the other two counterparts. And it really comes down to that discounted WTI prices, um, which really giving the U.S. refining fleet an advantage um, to access the cheaper crude feedstocks. So as crude oil prices have increased since uh, really September of last year, you can see the yellow line continues to to to, redu to drop, putting pressures on that on that U.S. refining fleet. And then, like I mentioned earlier, um, the the blue line, if you notice, it's taking a little bit of a downturn as well. Um, you know, as we see more geopolitical tensions um, come into the market and put and put more pressure on really the Brent pricing, we notice the spreads between Brent and WTI um, have uh, have begun to widen a lot more. And again, that's putting um, really the European um, uh, the refining assets at a bit of a disadvantage right now. So, Chris, if I could just get you to take a break, and I'm just going to walk folks through some of the current numbers that we're going to sort of slice and dice at a regional level. Um, as we can see here, uh, 256 billion planned to have a construction start or kickoff uh, in that 2018 to 19 period, and about 55 percent uh, of that is associated with grassroots development. Now, it is important to note. Uh, that uh, the grassroots spending represents not only uh, new refineries being built, uh, there certainly isn't 506 new refineries out there at the moment under construction uh, for the next couple of years, but also includes the new grassroots units, those new processing units within those grassroots uh, plants themselves. Now, um, if we look uh, to the right um, at the top refining project markets for the next two years uh, that we're currently tracking, we see obviously some familiar names in there, um, some heavy presence of those Asian markets, um, and even amongst those Asian markets, we see a good mix of some relatively newer players, I guess, who have started to come onto the scene. Indonesia um, is really one which is dominating the spending, certainly in Southeast Asia, but um, because they are starting from a lower base, a lot of those numbers are actually made up with an, a small number of fairly large grassroots uh, projects, uh, similar actually to Russia when I looked at the numbers there, that 27.6 billion is, uh, is, is very heavily dem dominated by one large $10 billion refinery. Um, look, and I know Chris is going to be touching on the US uh, very, very shortly, but even the US, which has you know, it's got a number of, uh, has a multi-billion dollar grassroots refinery, which is still in play, um, although at the moment this is rated as a medium probability project right now, and I'm sure Chris is going to touch on that a little bit more. Now, we always bandy around some pretty big numbers um, when, we, when we pull these webinars together. So what I wanted to do was really uh, just look at kind of stripping back those total active numbers and get down to the next level of detail and more specifically talk to you about uh, probability factors for a little while. Um, this really, I think, helps put some perspective around numbers that we're looking at. Um, and here's a ranking. If we look at the total active, we've got a ranking by market region of the planned spending for 2018-2019 timeframe. Uh, and obviously what we can see is Asia Pacific accounts for at least uh, or almost 40% of this total. Now, if we strip back those currently active projects, uh, we can see about 43% of those are rated or ranked by our research teams globally as having a high probability of moving forward as currently planned over the next 24 month period. So we should assume that these, uh, these projects in particular have a pretty strong likelihood of starting off and kick-starting construction 
um, barring, of course, as, as Chris alluded to, um, any seismic market shocks uh, that could possibly occur to derail things. Now, this when you when you do that, you just focus in on the high probability projects. We kind of see a reshuffling of that top top uh, tier uh, markets, and we see the inclusion now of Africa. Uh, and also that, those, that that Russian market as well, and also Western Asia as well, sort of dominates in the top five spenders based on those projects which we um, have rated as high probability. Now, what is interesting is if we just look at that medium probability band, uh, about 32% of the current plan spending is rated uh, as having a medium probability of moving forward right now. Now, um, our experience pretty much shows that some of this could indeed fall one way or the other. So um, some of it will obviously move forward. Uh, others will be a little bit more sensitive to the broader economic or competitive uh, changes. So what I've done is I've just stripped out those medium probability rated projects a little further uh, because we know that not all of that $86 billion will move into high rated projects, some indeed may, for whatever reason, may default down to a low probability rating and more typically may actually fall out or indeed see their start dates pushed out. Now, when I analyze the, the medium rated projects uh, a little further, uh, it transpires that of that $86.5 billion that's out there, around $36 billion of that spending has, um, has seen their original, first original start dates already slip more than two years. So they've been pushed out. Uh, they originated uh, in 2015, 16, etc. Uh, and if I strip it further, um, I found that, uh, you know, a further 26 billion of that um, had seen its actual start date slip by more than 37 months. So there is a lot of um, potential spend which is currently sitting within that medium rated band at the moment, which we feel, based on our research methodology, we feel that we'll actually uh, possibly get pushed out a little bit further beyond the 2019 time frame. Now, uh, with that as the backdrop, Chris, I just wanted to bring you back in the discussion and let's start drilling into some of our market regions. Obviously, the U.S. market, a uh, major market in terms of operational refineries, and I think despite some fairly healthy uh, domestic demand growth refined products and some very strong export numbers as well, we haven't really seen anything in the way of new grassroots refineries coming to market. Is that still the current state? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, there are two under construction, but they're rather small at this moment. So. Uh, kind of taking uh, North America and, and, and taking a deeper dive, um, there are 171 operating refining sites in North America, with the really majority of those residing in the U.S. As I said, there are two that are under construction, and another 11 that are um, you know proposed uh, in North America. Refining margins continue to be healthy as demand for gasoline and diesel remains strong domestically here. Um, again, we have that low unemployment. Um, we have a pretty bustling economy at the moment here. Um, but also exports into other markets such as Latin America, Europe, and even Asia uh, will continue to support um, those margins as well. This region ranks fifth compared to other regions in the world with just over $28 billion in proposed spending that we're tracking with the construction kickoff date of uh, 2018 through 2019. Taking a little bit deeper dive into the spending numbers, most of the investment, 62%, is really all allocated to growth initiatives, which is really grassroots and expansion activity. These projects represent large investments and typically have a low to medium probability rate as they are higher risk um, investment projects. In-plant spending, which includes projects that will optimize, improve reliability, increase product yields, tend to be more risk adverse and may address regional market concerns. Over the next two years, uh, we're tracking a number of projects to implement changes in the gasoline sulfur content, um, improve gasoline yields and add, add octane, plus address the IMO 2020 mandate, which is that bunker fill mandate we, we talked about a little bit earlier. All of this will require reduction of sulfur limits in bunker fill, uh, which will require sulfur limits in bunker fills. So the, the, that um, uh, that implant spend is really the sweet spot for the um, the North American refiners at the moment here. And then really looking at the maintenance spend, we're tracking more activity to occur in 2018 
than over the past two years compared to 2016 and 17. Uh, so as we move into 2019, the picture still looks a little unclear. It looks like it might be a little below 2018, but um, there's still um, a lot of uh, green space or a lot of time for refiners to, to uh, plan some turnarounds uh, next year. Uh, Chris, moving into East Asia, and I guess really when we talk about East Asia, it's it's very heavily do dominated by the Chinese market. Now, uh, again, this market, uh, you know, just looking at the composition of the spending plan, I guess this is where we're seeing a lot of that new build refining capacity that's, uh, that uh, we've been tracking globally uh, is actually coming from. Would you say that this is the biggest market for, for, for the new build activity currently? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, like you said, the East Asian market consists of around 166 operational refineries between China, Japan, and South Korea uh, and Taiwan, with really China dominating the region with over the, with about 130 of those oper of the operating plants and capacity of 11.5 million barrels a day, only second to really the U.S. We're tracking 637 active projects worth 40 billion of total investment value for the region. Um, again, scheduled to kick off this year, next year, with majority of those dollars allocated to China of about $34 billion. So taking that $40, $40 billion spend in, in total for the region, 70% or $28 billion is allocated to grassroots spending. Uh, that would add additional uh, 800,000 barrels a day, uh, excuse me, uh, grassroots spending. There are two refineries under construction in, in the region, both in China, they'll add another 800,000 barrels a day with another nine sites under consideration They'll add another two and a half million of grassroots uh, capacity in China and Mongolia. As far as new grassroots refineries, um, it is interesting to note that since the year 2000, there have been 50 plants commissioned in China alone. So we have certainly seen a significant amount. And I believe if you take that a little further, since the recession in 20, 2009, there were 19 of the 50. So the spending continues, spending waste certainly continues in China on grassroots activity. End plant spending is on the rise for the independent refiners in China, those teapot refineries, as refiner runs and margins continue to reach record highs due to healthy increases in the, uh, the government quotas to import more crude oil, as well as quotas to export additional refined products. So we've seen a significant uptick in activity for those teapots. In addition, investments to allow production of cleaner burning fuels to meet um, more stringent fuel mandates beginning 2020 through 2023. Even though China will likely see majority of spend, Korean refiners are also evaluating capital investments, which include integrating existing refining assets with petrochemicals production, adding value-added products to the revenue stream. And lastly, uh, Japan will likely see spending increase after 2019, it's outside this window, as a mandate to increase the resid oil cracking ratio um, has, has been mandated over the next couple of years. This may lead to larger projects such as expanding or modifying uh, coker capacity to be able to meet that mandate. Uh, now, Chris, um, all the numbers that we've been tracking over those particular markets have always you know, pointed upwards, and I guess uh, Europe is, is one of those markets which kind of bucks the trend, and I can only assume that the uh, you know, the, the, the continued trend of rising crude input prices must really be, um, I guess, a further major headache for European refiners right now. How are those European refiners navigating the current market conditions and where are they allocating their dollars? Yeah, you're absolutely right, absolutely right Shaheen. The, the European refining market is, continues to struggle with the profit margin since the recession in 2008, 2009. You know, the current fleet, the vast majority processes that sweet crude. Uh, which has been at a premium since the recession. So again, it comes back to what's the premium on Brent compared to the other benchmarks around the world. This coupled with long-term lower demand, new capacity and competition from more modern, uh, sophisticated plants in the Middle East and Asia, plus a turn to hybrid or, uh, or electric vehicles has caused a number of finding sites to be closed or converted over to storage terminals in this region. Margins have improved since hitting a two-year low in the industry, and the industry seems to have stabilized for the moment. We're currently tracking a little over $10.5 billion in active spending that may begin construction over the next two years. As a result of the shuttering of plants over the years, spending for grassroots and plant expansion activity is somewhat limited. The main driver of spending has been a focus on minimizing feedstock and operation costs by optimizing, revamping, and upgrading current operations. 
plus investing in value-added products by integrating into that petrochemicals production. Again, trying to extend the value train. We're currently tracking a, a number of projects in Latvia and Ukraine, which will allow for the production of cleaner burner fuels to meet environmental mandates. So it's really that Eastern part. And then a final note for this region, uh, there seems to be more attention on the bottom of the barrel upgrading projects in the future uh, to reduce crude feedstock costs, but this will require fairly large investments in long-term objectives for refiners. So you know, we think that um, the European market quite possibly could go through a bottom of the barrel upgrading or heavying up um, as we look into the longer term. So you know, maybe not in the next two years, but certainly in the longer term, we think that there's going to be uh, some significant spending going on in this region. Now, Chris, into, uh, I guess, my current market, the Middle East or, or, or the broader Western Asian market. Um, now, we've obviously, you know, I've seen firsthand uh, that that continued emphasis on building, uh, you know, greater levels of capacity, not only to meet domestic demand growth, but also uh, a big push, and that's come about in the last... 24 months for that exportable uh, product production. Um, now, when we do look at the numbers, uh, they, they tend to be pretty generous, um, those top line numbers, and they do tend to get a little swayed by the Iranian and Iraqi planned projects, which by and large, um, you know, haven't really moved along at any great pace. Uh, but parking those two markets in particular to one side, um, do we still see forward momentum across the rest of the Middle East, more particularly the GCC markets? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Iraq is really the, the swing swing country of this area that um, you can see spending. Um, but uh, the Western Asia, uh, which is really the Middle East, has three refiners under construction um, right, currently right now. Together, they will add another a little over 1.2 million barrels a day of new grassroots refining capacity to the region by the end of really next year. Uh, with Kuwait, Kuwait really adding the most, um, out of that 1.2, they're adding a little over 600,000, followed by Saudi and Turkey. We're currently tracking almost 34 billion of active project activity in the region that may begin again over the next two years. It seems logical that given the abundance of crude oil production in the area, there are another 13 uh, grassroots plants worth 20 billion currently under development. Uh, again, we, uh, with Iraq really uh, contributing to the most there. The driving factor of all this grassroots activity has really been uh, to, to transform economies going from just an oil exporter, diversifying into exporter of refined products, as well as in, uh, going into the petrochemicals industry. In addition, investments into plant expansions, unit additions, and in-plant segments are being considered, which will allow production of cleaner fuels um, to allow for exports into the areas that have more stringent requirement. So we continue to see cleaner fuels um, mandated by uh, you know, countries in the in the area, but also if they want to become more of an exporter, diversify, they're going to have to produce more and, and ship those products into Europe or other markets. They're going to have to produce that more stringent, cleaner fuels uh, to be able to, to export in those markets. Now, Chris, moving into our second to last market region of Southeast Asia, and you know, we've we've both been tracking this. This, this market for a number of years, and we've we've seen some. It, it continues to present some fairly large investment plans. Um, do the demand fundamentals still stack up to you know helping keep some of these big mega grassroots refineries that are being planned moving forward? Yeah, I think so. Um, I, you know, this is the when you look at the, the planned spending pipeline. This is the uh, the region that has the highest ranking of spend. Um, currently right now. So energy demand in Southeast Asia alone has grown over by uh, 60% over the last 15 years. And really looking out to 2040, uh, uh, energy demand will grow by almost two thirds as the region's economy triples in size. Really the population, the total population grows by a fifth with the urban population alone growing by another 150 million people. As a result, um, you know, that oil demand increase, um, as a result, oil demand increased by 2 million barrels per day from the current 4.7 um, to um, today um, by adding another 2 million barrels by 2040. As rising demand from mobility means the number of road vehicles increases by two thirds. As a result of that future demand, there are 33 uh, refineries under development of those, three are under, are under construction right now. Those three alone will add almost 700,000 barrels a day, barrel a day of new grassroots capacity to the system. 
um, uh, here shortly. Of the 35 billion we are tracking to begin construction in the next two years, 54% of almost 20 billion is really allocated to that grassroots spending alone. And it really comes down to, uh, you know, again, population growth, urbanization, as well as industrial manufacturing. Most of that's geared, geared to really, most of the jobs really geared to um, Indonesia. This is followed by another 7 billion in proposed plan expansions. So when I look at this, it's no surprise looking at that projected demand growth of the region. You know, most of that spending is allocated towards grassroots plan expansion types. Um, you know, we just think that the Southeast Asian market is going to be over the coming years really the hot market. Um, you know, for several different reasons. So, Chris, final market, South Asia, um, and obviously much of the spending outlook over the last couple of years, I'd say last five years, has, has certainly obviously been shaped by India and India's goal uh, to be a refined product export hub, certainly for that Asia Pacific or those near Asian markets in particular. Um, although obviously we, we have been trend tracking, um, you know, growth in that new capacity development is actually lagging the rapidly growing domestic demand. And I think that has probably knocked a little bit of some of those export volumes off the, uh, taking those out the market, um, really because a lot of that additional capacity has really been uh, driven to feed that very rapid uh, domestic demand growth. Now, we're obviously going to talk about India in particular, but are, could we see other South Asian markets possibly stepping up to the plate and looking to develop their own uh, new capacity? Yeah, absolutely. There are some surprising uh, some numbers in here. So for that South Asian market region, we're tracking a little over 27 billion of uh, project, spend, project activity over the next two years. 75% um, is geared towards India, like it has been over the last couple of years. But there are two refiners under construction. They're actually in Bangladesh, uh, with the remaining seven spread across India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, as well as Bangladesh. So yeah, so it kind of surprised me when you're looking at this region, it's all typically talk about India, but there are actually two that uh, are under construction right now. Those two refiners in Bangladesh will help um, to meet domestic demand, reduce the volumes and costs associated with importing fuels from abroad. So really just trying to to reduce their cost of imports. India is in the early stages of a major transformation. It is home to 18% of the world's population, but only uses 6% of the world's primary energy. And its energy consumption has almost doubled since the year 2000, and really shows no signs of faltering at this moment. They're the fourth, fourth largest refining hub in the world with ambitions to further strengthen their position. Through capacity, throughput capacity will increase from the present 4.9 or almost 5 million barrels a day to 8.4 by 2022. And looking at that addition, 1.3 will come from grassroots and another two will come from expansions. The government's clean fuel, fuel drive initiative anticipated growth in transport uh, demand, air travel and the growth for petrochemicals will act as a boon for, for gasoline, jet fuel, LPGs, naphthas, ethylene oil products to to, to post close to double digit growth in 2017, you know, which is really similar to what we've seen over the past couple of years. Some of the implant spending we're tracking will target the production of cleaner fuels with investments of 4 billion or more through 2020. India is a diesel based economy with diesel counting for a little over 41% of the share of the total product demand. India still imports LPG for domestic use and it contributes 31% of the share in the petroleum product import bill. So with government initiatives to totally eliminate kerosene demand from cooking by 2040, India is expected to be, to be the world's largest LPG consuming market. Um, this has helped the US NGL producers indirectly um, as they backfill really the void of propane, which is a part of that NGL component into really the Japan and South Korean markets. So there is a little connection of uh, really South Asia to really the North American markets there. Well, Chris, in the interest of time, I'd just uh, like to wrap up, uh, but obviously say a very big thank you to you for sharing your insights today. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, and of course, um, as always, a very big thank you to our sponsor today, Hilco Filtrations. Many thanks for your support. Um, Going forward, uh, or looking back, 
so to speak. Uh, if you'd like to review this discussion again, it has been recorded, or simply just then uh, simply register on our portal, you'll actually get access to some of the uh, previous webinars or outlooks that we've presented over the last uh, 24 months. But more importantly, please stay tuned going forward as we've got a number of uh, uh, webinars planned for the next couple of months. We have the global power generation and the chemical processing outlooks taking place uh, over the uh, beginning of the summer. So uh, I personally look forward to speaking with you uh, very soon. Uh, please stay tuned. Thank you.